everyone. Um, and welcome to the uh, Zykus webinar today. Uh, my name is Yash, and I would be your host for today. Uh, today's webinar is in collaboration with uh, Melanie Flores from the Hackle Group, and she will be speaking on upgrading your supplier risk program. Uh, before we start, just a few housekeeping tips for you. At any point in time, you may send us a question in the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner of your uh, screen. Uh, we are having some issues with responding to them via text, but uh, we'll address your questions towards the end of the webinar uh, by reading them out. Uh, if you have any other questions, we, we will be uh, reaching out to you fairly soon. Um, so just to start off, uh, Zykus, uh, as you may know, Zykus is a leading provider of complete source space suite for procurement performance solutions. And uh, a positive list of product portfolio includes application for both strategic and operational aspects of procurement. Uh, since 2013, Zykus has been a part of the uh, Gartner's uh, Magic Quadrant for Strategic Sourcing Application Suites and has been positioned in the, uh, the highest for its ability to execute. Now, uh, without taking any more time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass on the ball to me and uh, get started off with the webinar. Melanie, over Thank to you. you yeah. Thank you, uh, Yash, and, and thank you, uh, the entire Cycle team, for inviting me. Um, just really a couple of, of words. Um, for me, as, as you said, I manage uh, at Hackett, uh, I mean, our advisory practice, and I'm very glad uh, to be with you. So we are going to be trying to answer all the questions um, that we get from you. During the session, as, as just uh, mentioned, if there is anything that we cannot um, get uh, uh, to our point, uh, we definitely are going to come back to you um, with responses. So let me just start very briefly to um, the happy group for those organizations that uh, might not be that familiar uh, with us. We are um, an intellectual capital and implementation organization, um, we really define um, and uh, identify the world-class performance in a particular function. We do this across a number of functions, and definitely this is what we do in the same way in, in procurement. And so um, as part of the solution, our solution portfolio, and many of you might be aware of our benchmarking capabilities. Um, we, this is still the core of what we do at Hackett in terms of being empirical based. And you see some of the information that I'm going to be sharing, which comes from some of our performance studies that are um, used. We have a transformation in consulting practice, and we have and the advisory um, organization, which is a membership base, and is um, the organization that I um, lead in IMEA. So let's um, start uh, really into the details of the topic today, and which is about risk. And before I get into this specific graph, let me just probably talk about you know, what is, and, and I think this is one of the important exercises to do in terms of defining what is risk in other organizations. And definitely when you are um, experiences with other organizations, I think it's important to um, discuss a little bit about the about the um, definitions behind that. And if you are familiar with Hackett, you know that we like to have a lot of definitions and to make sure that our organizations are talking about um, the same thing. So when we talk about risk and risk exposure, when we look at the probability that an event may occur, um, and, and this event might have a particular impact on the company. So we ran a study um, looking at the supply risk management programs and the main drivers of creating a supply risk management uh, procurement organization. So obviously risk is part of what we have been doing in, in the procurement function. And having said that, we have been 
probably starting with 2008, uh, it was a period when organizations were doing a lot of things around risk management because of the economic conditions. Um, and we saw, as obviously um, the economy was recovering, gone a little bit. So it has been always in the radar of what uh, the profit organizations are doing. So it's definitely important. But still, we see, um, you know, continuous interest in how to update the risk management programs that organizations have. So in this study that I was talking to you and the, the information that you're going to be looking at um, today. It covers. Um, it comes from that particular study that we um, ran here. We look at and we try to see an integrated view of risk. So a different type of of risk. For example, supply uh, supply risk events, and uh, things that have to do with clearly supplier bankruptcies, mergers and acquisitions, and all those type of things specific to supplier uh, events. So that has to do with external market events. Um, you know. So, Financial crisis, um, price of supply volatility, uh, you know, disasters, environmental disasters, for example. Uh, also, that have to do with an internal event to the organization, things such as fraud or um, IP loss or stalling, um, and things around technology related type of events, things that have to do with cyber attacks. So, that's the, the definition, if you will, of the, um, the scope of the, the uh, when I talk about risk, what I'm uh, the focus of, of the study and, and the information that I'm going to be sharing with you. So there is a lot of um, interest in, in looking at the risk programs um, and how the, you know organizations are managing the risk. And uh, one of the areas that um, we understand, we want to understand uh, with the companies is why. And drivers of creating and upgrading those supplier uh, risk management programs. And the reason why this is relevant is because this, this is one of the, the important things in understanding what is what you are trying to uh, protect. Uh, and it might be different type of things that you are trying to protect, and therefore the supplier risk programs that have been developed and have, may have a different um, Focus on different aspects. It is about what I was talking about in terms of supplier risk of events that are critical for an organization, or might be external market events, or even technology related events. Depending on these, the organizations might have a different focus, if you will, in the supplier um, risk and management programs. Now, it, it, this is a consolidated response. These are the three main drivers. There are many other drivers that um, organizations have, but I just wanted to show you the, the, the top three. And, and we asked organizations to, to uh, let us know if it was a critical, medium, low, or not a driver at all. And if you see the number one, which is clearly, clearly you know, the, the, with 48%, clearly the, the number one is about ensuring supply continuity. And it has to do in, in the, you know, with this uh, physical uh, supply chain. Um, so if we look, this, sorry, this information is cross industry. So if we look at uh, organizations that are in the manufacturing side, this is clearly one of the, the most important for them. Now, uh, you see the second one, ensure regulatory compliance. Uh, depending again on the industry that you are in, this might be uh, more relevant than others. Also, depending on the geographies, we have the largest operations potentially, and it might be also an important factor for organizations saying, well, this is a, a clear main drive for, for us. And then number three is ensure supplier financial um, security. And this typically tends to be quite high in organizations that are not manufacturing or rather in the services space. And, um, and if you see the number two, the one in the middle actually impacts both um, source um, finance, uh, sorry, uh, services um, as well as uh, manufacturing. Now, the drivers, and probably when, when you look at um, your, your own list and your own drivers, you might have different than these. And number four um, and five 
are things, and I, and I just want to mention those, because the number four is actually manage price fluctuations, which uh, tends to be um, quite high. It can have a very high impact in, in, in organizations, but also from a procurement point of view and the type of things that we could um, impact. Um, having said that, it's not seen as critical as the other three that you have. And there is also something that, that um, brings a lot of attention is a lot of in, in, in the price is there are some, some uh, so events uh, taking place, which is about geopolitical risks. And again, they are there, um, having said that it is not uh, one of the major drivers that organizations see in terms of the supply management programs. So, um, why is this important? As I said, really depends on what organizations have a focus on. At least, definitely, that's the best practice. You know, what is what you are trying to protect? What are the type of events that you um, need taking care of? You know, to understand what your risk exposure is, and and so what the mitigation practices they're going to be using in order to manage that risk is important. But as you see, there are some commonalities. Uh, definitely across organizations. Now, if we if we um, look at what um, doing um, this and, and what are drivers, let me just um, go to the next slide to talk a little bit about the challenges that um, procurement organizations uh, face in this area. And um, you might be facing some of some of this, or actually might have. And be to address and, and to go over some of these. But what to a lot of organizations, and these are the type of things that we um, hear quite quite often. And let me just go to them because I think there are some interesting um, information, some, some interesting learnings about this. Uh, first of all, is, is one of the main challenges is about procurement. I'm going from the bottom, from top, uh, top to the bottom. Procurement is responsible for supply management, but actually is not having the mandate. It's quite, quite often, um, or not having the resources. Now, we, we in procurement have been always pushed to do more with less, as probably everybody in the organization. And clearly, risk is some of those things that are necessarily, and again, depending on, on the specifics of the organization, but some of those things that are not just not necessarily present there. And sometimes is uh, you know the awareness or the um, concerns are going higher or lower. But in principle, this is something um, that is, uh, is is not necessarily present as other types of things. So we might be using the resources for supplier management programs or for trying to expand our influence, overspend, and getting more savings, or engaging with the, our internal stakeholders and you know, be able to provide for the value in other areas, etc. So, from a resources point of view, definitely this is something that is constrained. And there are some important things to learn from organizations that have been done in addressing this, which have to do uh, with some of the other issues that it's about identifying, quantifying the cost of the program, uh, what would the return investment, and for for the activities that are uh, being in place. This is from a resource point of view. In terms of the mandate, it's also an important point. Definitely, when we talk about supplier risk management, procurement is, is in the uh, you know the first probably address to um, think about. But in terms of um, mitigating risk, not necessarily a procurement is the one that can be doing something. Uh, could be um, actually doing and implementing. Um, and at many organizations, it's not absolutely clear uh, who should be doing what. So not having the mandate is definitely one of the things that back procure organizations. And the second point is, is about the impact and uh, the ability to measure the value that is generated through some of those programs. So I would say investing in a, in a, a risk uh, management program, upgrading what we are doing, potentially acquiring a, a technology, um, or even a, a moving resources to be focusing on that, and is is uh, which might help in in, um, 
your performance in terms of managing the, the risk. Um, it's important, however, organizations still struggle to measure the value generated. In some cases, because it's, it's truly difficult to do this, uh, we are just to easier for us in procurement to track uh, transactional things or, or track our savings. And but those type of things are one risk. Will be um, definitely organizations are lagging in, in the in the practice around that. Cost effectiveness is is one of the issues that um, are identified. Quantifying the cost of the program to say um, how um, what are the, the, the costs associated with those programs um, is, is also something that many organizations are not um, aware of. Um, when we want some of our studies and we ask in terms of cost, in terms of number of FTEs, doing those type of activities, it's a struggle with, with um, responding. At the FT level, they might get to that, um, but the rest uh, is something that is not um, quantified a lot. And um, another one is around um, multi-dimensional um, risk assessment that are, that are done and you know, have a different um, dimensions. Um, they might need to be looking at suppliers or um, spend categories or specific products, etc. I'm going to go as well into a little bit more detail on that. So it, it is a challenging area for, for procurement issues in, in terms of, from a governance point of view, from process and performance management point of view um, as well. But definitely there are some good, uh, you know, some organizations that have managed to and to go through that. This slide is about the point about measuring the value generated. And, um, this, uh, this is really interesting to see that the, you're asking organizations what are the type of measurements, the measurement that you're doing uh, of the value that is uh, quantified, that is, comes from from your activities in risk management, from the programs that you have put in place. And actually what, what we hear is the number one. You see, I, I included only the top three again in this, in this slide. There are some others. Um, but if you look at the, the top three, very close to each other, the, the percent of organizations saying, yeah, this is this, um, this, uh, um, some of the, the metrics that we use in how to assess the value. You see the number one is the number of percentage of risk assessment and, and the um, cycle time required. So uh, this is, 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 is one of the most simple tricks, a, a progress or a scope type metric in the sense of how many we should be doing, and clearly it's important the cycle time because this procurement doesn't want to be a bottleneck and needs to be on time uh, not, not taking uh, you know, several weeks and months in order to be able to do that, particularly when depending on the event, the, the, the sometime requires to be more, much, much faster. But in principle, although the great majority of the organizations, over 40% of the organizations are saying this is the way that we quantify the, the value today, um, it, it is actually quite, quite simple. And, and, but we also think that it has to do, and, and we make some interviews with some organizations, it also has to do with the maturity of the programs, the maturity of the, the activities around risk management. And definitely, organizations target to you know, doing those assessments, complete those assessments for the uh, critical suppliers or for the critical events. And, and therefore, we see this is actually the number one. Number two is clearly it's clear impacts uh, um, on regulatory related metrics depending on the industry. There might be some specific um, uh, you know, things you need to require that you're required to comply with. Therefore, organizations track this. If you think about in terms of why organizations were doing this, uh, regulatory compliance was the number two, so it's clear that organizations are trying to be able to comply to report. Uh, on that, and therefore we see in a good uh, number of organizations um, from those type of things. The number of things is when we start to see it more interesting type of things. 
where organizations um, assess the impact of their programs and the, the overall uh, activities on a composite uh, risk scoring index. I try to understand um, what risk score or risk index that they build. And in order to do this, well, they need to, it's much more complex than the rest, clearly. They understand what are the type of, um, again, what, what they're, they are trying to protect, what are the type of risk that they need to be looking at uh, and, and take that index and track the impact of the programs in a particular index. And then I have different variables depend on how they, you know, the risk profile and trying at the end to protect the posture that they have. So these are more complicated ways of um, tracking value, but definitely after organizations, you know, are going through the more, the, the, the less mature, uh, go through assessing the, the, the supply or conduct just risk assessments, and they, they should definitely go into uh, understanding what is the risk um, index that they might be looking at for for their session. Now, um, I said these are just the top three. I didn't include the entire list. But interesting, 27% uh, of organizations are actually not quantifying that. It's, and we hear a different type of comments um, saying, well, it is too complex. Uh, definitely, you want to do it properly, it's not as easy as to, you know, just pick the first metric that uh, you think in terms of progress of what you are doing. Um, fully agree. I'm saying that um, definitely if you want to have the resources you think about the challenges, you want to have resources, you want to have focus uh, on the things that you are doing in risk management, definitely an area uh, to be focused on uh, and tracking value. Is, is important. With um, performance tracking is and, and metrics, uh, it has to be a balance between the, the right metrics, the right index, if you will, uh, rather than just picking many things that actually you cannot measure, and then at the end it becomes more uh, difficult to track, and people just decide to do it because they don't have the data. Now, there are some other type of uh, interesting metrics to look at. Uh, definitely something that I would recommend to organizations to think about that. Um, metrics such as uh, the impact of the programs on the over margin at risk or revenue at risk. We have, as, as, uh, as I was saying, the hacker group has a, a, a um, one of our solution portfolio is a benchmarking, so we benchmark organizations in the procurement functions. And we have definitely asked organizations about um, what are the, the metrics like this in terms of risk and what are the improvements that they have um, had in, in some of these metrics around risk. And we see that, again, this is something that many organizations not necessarily are tracking and definitely something uh, to um, recommend. So, um, for those of you that are trying to upgrade, they are looking into your um, risk programs, definitely um, a point to consider is how you are going to assess um, the value of the activities you are doing, um, definitely internally for your organization, but when you are talking to your internal customers, is something that um, most probably everyone would like to understand. Okay, another point that I was referring to in terms of the challenges um, that they are facing has to do with uh, a certain extent with the data that they have. Um, but we were looking at organizations uh, in terms of the levels of granularity of the, uh, the supply risk assessment that they are doing, the segmentation and the reporting that they are doing. Um, and it's a very important role how your systems are um, set. Um, but what are the data structures, how, how this is uh, related so that you're able to, to do a, a number of these great assessments and, and at the end of the day, um, reporting and analysis. But we are looking at the levels of granularity, and we said that it, it really is 
um, if you see this, I again included only the, the first um, three. And look at the first um, three um, level granularity. The number one is about individual supply levels. Organizations 68% will look at individual suppliers. And you look, when we make analysis about this, actually number two and number three, the majority of organizations are doing it at the time or to, to each other. And let me explain. So the same one is about, for example, a particular um, product category, and they are uh, looking into all the suppliers or particular supplier because whatever is critical or in my strategic suppliers. And um, so they are not necessarily going through all the, those uh, different suppliers that they have. This is a great majority of their companies are doing. They pick a um, uh, category, for example, and then they go deeper. And now, it's about um, the, these different levels. I think it's going to be important uh, for you to look at the segmentation of your suppliers. How do you have been doing that segmentation? Because it might be that you might be losing some of those that potentially are small suppliers, uh, but not the absolutely strategic or critical suppliers. And that it would have been worth to uh, look at those. And this depends, again, in terms of what you're trying to protect, in terms of the type of um also that you have um, not necessarily the traditional ABC type of supplier segmentation might be the optimal for that and organizations need to be aware of that so when you do in helping your uh, risk program look at look at the segmentation again uh, in the in the view of what you are trying to protect what are the risk events uh, one for you and then decide to um, you know whether whether you might want to include some uh, suppliers, some some other spend categories, etc. Okay. So we made an analysis uh, in terms of the different um, risk events that I mentioned um, when started in terms of supply risk events, uh, external market events, technology related, and as the in that organizational related type of events. And we made an analysis in terms of what the, the risk exposure. And the way we define risk exposure, you see at the bottom of the, the page, we look at the problem, we ask organizations in terms of looking at the probability of that event taking place, the impact that that particular event might have, and what is the ability to mitigate risk. So we, we use that equation if you will in order to understand what the risk exposure is and across all the different elements of risk um, and you can you can read the list. I just want to I want to focus on a couple of them. And really the number one is a fiscal crisis in key economies. Uh, this is number one because as as you might, um, have experienced and it's very difficult to do something uh, about this when and this is happening and you know, the impact can be quite large um, in a particular um, economy that you are in. Um, if this is happening, it's, it's, it's difficult to um, to go out to mitigate some of those, some of the risks and the impact can be quite, quite extensive. So really the, the number one. Now, the number two is regulatory changes and non-compliance. Uh, again, depending on the industry, this might be more critical than others, but if you see across the organizations that we were um, looking at when um, we were doing this study last year, there were over 100. We clearly regulatory changes, unexpected regulatory changes, this has a very, uh, you know, a very high impact, and you are not dependent on, on the change, but also if you are not a very agile organization, your ability to mitigate and to, to implement those changes might be uh, quite high. And non-compliance is still uh, you know, very high. It, it depends on the regulation 
organizations are struggling to know how far they should go within about the first supplier, the second uh, year, the third year, how we can manage that. And so compliance is quite fragile. Number three, large scale cyber attacks. Now, this is an interesting one because if you think about, um, we were one of these studies in three years before. Uh, um, 2015 when we were this this study um, and and it was not quite high in some industries again for some organizations it was very important but overall you see this this has become a very important point for majority of the organizations and um, and this is something that potentially was very important for the company as such but it was not really in the radar of the procurement function and now we see that this number three has become quite important for procurement. And if you think about procurement, uh, being in the middle or facilitating the integration with um, your suppliers and making utilizing this digitization um, chain, um, opening the doors to suppliers so to, that you are able to connect and bring all that efficiency and that they might enable. Still, we are opening the doors for um, you know, external organizations. So it has very good things to do with. Uh, still, program is to start looking into this area, talking to the IT organization, understanding, and, and at least really at least having a point of view in terms of how this is going to be managed and uh, understand um, the, the impact that this might have. In and, and can in the organization can help and clearly I think my one of the um, addresses to discuss start discussing those topics. Definitely recommend uh, you in case you have not been doing that to start looking into that direction. Um, no environmental disasters um, are again um, to predict um, difficult to um, mitigate. And still, there are some things uh, that uh, can be done, and definitely organizations uh, need to understand if this is a particular area that may in them uh, kind of having different suppliers for the particular um, spend, uh, you know, sets or uh, material that you source an area that is uh, disasters are. Um, quite um, um, quite often, you need to be taken to, into consideration this. Number five, supply quality events, acquisitions, mergers, important for us in procurement. Um, the the uh, map can change, the landscape can be, uh, have some, you know, at the same time, could, could uh, bring good um, also for the social, for our procurement organization from a social point of view, but not necessarily. So acquisitions emerge from suppliers, all those competitive events still in the list, actually the number five quite high. Purchase price escalation. And I, I think here we start to see the typical, if you will, procurement related or more traditional type of risk um, events that procurement typically deals with or have been focused on price escalation, currency, inflation, those type of things, price and supply volatility. Um, in, 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 these, in the markets that we are in, we see this um, quite a lot in, in, in the last years. Um, but these are the more traditional, if you will, events. currency movements. And, and number nine and ten are in linked to, um, link to data. And I think that probably potential some companies have been um, on that for many years. Not it might not be the case for the others. Loss and thief of sensitive private data can have very important um, in terms of brand, for example, but also in terms of um, uh, when you generate it. And, and about you know, authorized uh, motivation or disclosure of confidential information. In the um, European uh, region, there are some 
very strict, depending on the on the in the country again, there are some strict um, rules and relations around that. So still, is uh, it, it, it appears in the number ten list of the top ten with the highest uh, exposure rate. So um, my question is, which ones for those, uh, which ones for you are the most important ones? Which you need to protect um, in your organization, which ones you are going to be probably focusing on um, as, as, as the main for your specific uh, program. Um, so let me go to the mitigation risk practices. And there, it, there is a very large number of, of practices around mitigating risk. And depending on the event, there might be, uh, be one or the other one. Um, Said that I selected these five. There are many others again, depending on the risk. But some of these are quite common. Some of some of these I get a lot of questions about, uh, or I might be um, quite high in the agenda for for the regulation coming in, etc. So uh, let me go through through them. And contract terms. Contract terms is, is one of the potentially easy ones in terms of um, through contract terms addressing and trying to mitigate risk. A number of areas, and we made analysis of that, and we have organizations that have been doing this in the, uh, um, in the um, tracking the the risk, and we found that statistically that actually there is not that effective at meeting risk. Um, so uh, depending on the specific risk that you are looking into, you might need to go even deeper. For example, conduct audits in, in, if you are trying to get compliance, for example, from your suppliers, etc. Not everything that can be in the contract terms is very effective in mitigating risk. The next one is about, um, for example, this currency in emerging market risk. And we risk about um, um, business in emerging markets. And some of the ones that we found that really significantly reduce some of the, some of those risks is about testing the market for alternative supply sources. And there are other options. And this one in particular, when we analysis was, was quite good. If you think about market intelligence as one of the core areas, one of the cost of procurement functions in her getting the right information from from the marketplace, and this is this is of the type of things where market intelligence can also help driving uh, benefits in, in terms of uh, mitigating some risks. Definitely an area to look at, and obviously, uh, obviously focus on trying to improve capabilities in, in that market intelligence that is more timely delivered, so that you can use, use it for your risk assessment. This is about taking time and resources to improve supply performance. And it has been uh, out there for many for many years. I think this is, well, probably not, probably all of them have been around. They are not very new things. Now, what we're trying to do is understand what was the impact in terms of mitigating risk or not. And we feel that particularly in that and dedicating this time and resources to, the, uh, to improve the supply performance, help to reduce the risk. And the number is quality, service, cost, and the impact that this might have is quite high. So you might want to think that this is the supplier management program that you might have running. Um, clear risk is, is, is taught all those different elements of the procurement function, but time and resources uh, to supply performance is absolutely critical, and your program most probably is linked to the uh, supply performance, supply ship management type of product you have. Okay. Now, nowadays, let me go to the next one. Nowadays, we see that uh, the procurement function is getting smaller and it's more and more giving away, if you will, pieces exit by other organizations, by, by an outsourcing partners. And this is not only the procurement function, this is a company taking place. A particular pieces of activity or core that is given to other organizations. 
that it might be, as I said, in the procurement function, it might be in other areas. Now, we have identified that the reverse analysis of the, the parts as such can reduce the risk of, for example, sensitive data loss, uh, which is important depending on the type of information that you are sharing with them. Uh, remember, there was, uh, in general, it was quite high the, um, uh, the risk exposure in, in data loss, in sensitive data loss. Now, when it comes to the effect that this might have in a risk analysis of the sourcing partner, in terms of the success or even failure of the, of the sourcing program, uh, uh, this, we didn't find a very close link into the cost. So, this is something that we need to do when, when looking at outsourcing at partners. And having said that, not necessarily something the risk is not going to be um, at a, a high level of that. And the last one is about audit against the code of conduct. And every organization probably now has a code of conduct, but these audits against that code of conduct can reduce the likelihood of sensitive issues. Um, it's again, important. Now, unfortunately, we've come to brand issues. Um, these are really difficult to mitigate. Uh, the sustainability agenda is very important, and you need to have those code of conduct, but you need to go to some of it. It's part of the question. Uh, some of those things are difficult to mitigate. Important is that you have a good process in place. You can uh, see that some of those things are common and identified. And upfront and as much um, as possible mitigate. So this is just a list of you know, five of them. There are many others for each of the risks that we were talking about. So those risks are due to um, to mitigate, put in practice uh, um, something in order to mitigate. Some of those are easy for us to be doing something. We have more information. There are many other practices that have some of those um, which you and stage. So let me go to the um, to tell my procurement organizations and what is what the organization, the procurement functions are doing in order to do a comprehensive approach for supply risk management. Those programs that you have in place. And we see some challenges at organizations. We have been going through some of them. But we see that the CPO seems to be the majority of the organizations the only accountable for minor reporting. A risk. Uh, now, when it comes to the mitigation action, all those activities, mitigation activities that we have been taken and action of that is being less clear. So, so it, part of your program, you may want to look at not only reporting, monitoring, and potentially help drive um, clarity in terms of, of the, the, the actual steps that need to be taken once you present for example, to the business, okay, this is this is the result. We're bringing you this. We are highlighting this so that you are able to make a, a decision here. Uh, would it be good that part of your program do you consider in, in terms of making that um, clear? Uh, because at the organization, that's not the case. And then to the some of the decisions that seem to be um, <clears throat> at many organizations, um, and others that is not that common, but still be important for you. For example, 28% of the organizations do not have a process in place for those uh, that I was talking about, small suppliers, um, non-strategic suppliers, with access to sensitive data. So I'm saying this is one of the important areas, not number one. Uh, having said that, it is still in the list of the top 10, and we see that actually we don't have a process. The majority of the process are not having a process in place for that. This back again to the question about how you are segmenting, um, what is what you are trying to protect and potentially reduce the type of office. This point um, is, is actually quite impressive. 85% of the organizations that, that we were uh, asked about their supplier risk programs, they say they have a medium or low level of satisfaction uh, using uh, new feed aggregators to help more monitoring risk. Um, so, this brings to, to the thing to what I was talking about in terms of market intelligence, in terms of um, 
the entire big data discussion, how to use data, structure and structure outside of the organization, etc. So there are a lot, of, a lot that can be done. A clean to style looking at your um, the data uh, for where it shows the, the entire use that you can uh, uh, get analytics that you can make using uh, data and from there building up. But market intelligence and news feeding, how you can use that formation is important. So making that more effective definitely might be able to contribute to uh, your particular um, program. And 75% um, have a dedicated supply risk team within procurement. This is, a, this is typically a question that we get quite a lot from the organizations that we work with. Do we need to have a supply risk team? Um, is, uh, it is not part of the, the normal um, way that uh, the, the procurement function should operate. It's not part of the category management. And uh, it's not part of the supply. Uh, also, um, relationship management type of work. You see, seventy-five percent have a data supply risk team. This not necessarily being a very large team, but dedicated and associates looking at supply risk definitely linked into the other dimensions of supply management, category management, etc. Cannot be an isolated activity. It is not. It has components in all in all those areas. So important to, to consider that. Okay. So um, I'm going to go at the last slide and, and uh, hope that we might have time for some of your questions. And so close remarks. Uh, what I'm showing you is, is um, some of the areas that we have seen that most organizations are struggling with, kind of the value, etc. But in general, I would say it's very important when you are upgrading your programs that you're thinking about what do we need to protect. It comes back to the point of what are the drivers of doing a program and not be the same ones for every organization. So therefore, it's difficult to say, well, you know, this is, this is the, the way to do it for everyone. And what do we need to protect? I think it's very important because this is going to give you focus in terms of implementation, the type of events, how you're going to shape your, your own program. Uh, and you might have to make some trade-offs in terms of are we able to address all these, are we able to report in all those areas, and probably not. So it's very important to have quite clear this and have an agreement with the business in terms of, yes, this is what we really need to protect. So this cannot be procurement own decision or exercise. This has to be discussed with the business. It has to be clear that from a company point of view, from an enterprise point of view, in supply, in procurement, supply risk management, this is what we are trying to protect. Um, the second point, um, the use of uh, the PO and procurement is, is um, uh, put as a responsible and, and for, for um, looking into the risk management piece, definitely integrated with the corporate risk management efforts. Uh, certainly, there is another instance in the organization of, um, that is looking into risk management. It's very important to have the programs are not focused in a particular area. There might be some things that are happening that are taking place at the entire uh, the corporate level, at the enterprise level, that might have an impact in your particular programs. So it's important to understand, first of all, clearly that you're aligned, but also understand, for example, what are some of those cross-functional um, elements that you need to be considered the business and provide visibility of uh, what you're doing. And, and, and very important point, have a clear operating model. And um, have a clear operating model in terms of these are the activities that we're going to be undertaking. This is the this is the governance uh, or this is the modeling by which we are going to be showing the assessment we're going to be highlighting. And particularly when it comes to the actions that might be taken from all of those assessments, you have the goals in place and around how you're going to be executing, who's going to make the decision. So I think it's important to have a clear operating model. If you're um, looking at your programs again, make sure that it's not only that uh, uh, index of those metrics or those activities, it's also part of the operating model that needs to be in place. Next point, 
a process at the rules, um, as I would say, to a certain extent, and, and tools. And it's important that it's systematic and becomes the way that you go about um, you know, acting with suppliers and doing business. So the, it needs to come to the level that becomes systematic. Frame supplier risk uh, holistically. Uh, our recommendations implementing phases potentially align with other processes, as, as we would say, supplier management, inventory management, and et cetera. Um, my last point is about supplier risk. Uh, model is, is dynamic and should evolve over time. I think some of the uh, um, mistakes that we see that happen is that all those models stay for too long. This is the way that we have been doing it for a number of years, and, and it, works. it was something that we didn't foresee it's coming because the, the models as such are not dynamic. So they need to definitely evolve over time, and you need to put in place, as, as part of those processes that I was talking about, evolve and part of the processes to continue looking at our do we need to reshape some of those areas because we're entering because our business, our industry is changing and potentially the type of risk, the type of segmentation, the type of risk event, the type of supply segmentation, etc. that we were using becoming outdated and, and and we need to protect something different. We are moving to another dimension. This this is very important. And there are always opportunities to look at that. Um, you have I don't know, your CEO is, is uh, um, talking about the new, um, you know, the strategy you're going to have in the next five years or the next three years, uh, or anything like that is a good uh, opportunity to uh, look at your models. But overall, the, the main point is it needs to be dynamic. And much, it should be architected and automated. Very, um, very important. The reason why needs to be detected is, is because there are so many elements, the same point around automated, there are probably so many elements important to uh, bring them, all of them together and that is not a very time consuming. If you see, when I get asked um, how many people are, are um, uh, in, in some of those risk assessments, it can, first of all, typically they take, they take long and well, just too many people trying to Put data from all those different places. So coming back to the to the big data um, issue, but that's absolutely true. So uh, also we need, always need to be more or less. We need to make sure that we have that um, automated so that um, can be really systematic. That and I think we went through a lot of material. Um, as I said, there are many other practices of mitigating risk. Um, but um, I hope that we uh, give you a view in terms of some of the key areas to to look at your reshaping your programs. Um, so I think we have uh, some minutes for questions. So let me see. I'm just uh, looking at some of the questions that are here. Okay. For example. Um, in our organization events, uh, the question is about what type of, of events. Um, in, when we talk about internal organizations, something that is generated from internal, internally is about, for example, fraud, corruption, or P that gets lost um, or stolen. Um, you know, those type of things are um, typically quite quite low in in, in the organizations. It might have Unfortunately, uh, organizations, different cultures, but in principle, this is this is not something that uh, that is quite high in the agenda. Um, okay, I have another question in terms of this risk index yeah, um, in, the, in the metrics. Well, the questions have to do with um, uh, sorry, the risk index have to do with which elements you are going to be looking at uh, from this point. Point of view, um, so that you can highlight uh, probably your scorecards green, uh, green, red, uh, 
and that allows you to go into more detail. It's important to understand what, what elements you are going to include. There are some other metrics, for example, such as uh, the one that I was uh, referring to. Let me just see if I can find it. Um, uh, well, I don't find it uh, fast, but it was about um, when you have at risk, um, you have a, a good um, indicator, for example, to share internally, but all internally within a procurement function, but externally um, is, um, is, is always a, a good indicator in terms of how to, how to go about that. And you need to understand, let me just go back to this. So what are the elements of your high risk um, exposure based on your specifics? And then um, certainly consume of those elements that you are going to be looking at for, for index that you are going to build. Okay. Um, Any other questions? Um, let me go through this. No, we are we are uh, have a lot of material. Um, so I think those are all the questions. So if I don't see any question coming in, and well, I think we are almost at the top of the hour. Um, thank you very much um, for your participation, and thank you very much again to the team for inviting me to present. If there are any other questions later on, please uh, share those uh, with me. I'm happy to, happy to um, respond to you later on. With that, um, back to you, um, Yash. Thank you, Melanie. That was very insightful indeed. And uh, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to go on. And uh, hope it was uh, Inside for you as well. Uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be sending the recording to uh, all those who have registered, and the webinar will also be available on the Zykus website after a couple of days. Uh, once again, thank you. Have a great afternoon, and thank you, Melanie.